So let's shift to the second major topic, which uh, I'm calling the suburbs. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so notwithstanding the existing contracts between TriMet and Clackamas County, uh, the, at least the political environment for Portland, Milwaukee, Light Rail and Clackamas County has gotten somewhat hostile um, in recent months or recent years. Um, what's the impact of opening service to a district that doesn't appear to be particularly enthusiastic about having you come to them? Um, and what's that going to mean in the short term and the long term, do you think? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I would tell you, excuse me, that um, really just about every light rail line we've ever opened has had opposition. And what has happened over time is the community has embraced it in a very big way. Um, I would also tell you that within the environs of the uh, Portland Milwaukee Light Rail, there is a lot of support for the project and a lot of embedded support. We have a very dedicated, for example, Citizens Advisory Committee. They have a number of champions, uh, primarily from the Oak Grove area in Clackamas County, but also from Milwaukee. Now, no doubt there's controversy associated um, that has been stirred up, but one of the things I think we have to demonstrate is what a great alternative it is and how important it is for the residents of Clackamas County to be connected to the jobs engines, for example, at Oregon Hill Sciences University in the South Waterfront, uh, to the educational opportunities at OMSI, to Portland State University, to the jobs inventory in downtown and elsewhere through the light rail system. Um, and I, so I think that, plus the speed of that alignment, that will be very efficient alignment and make a very efficient trip uh, for the residents of the county, I think will win the day um, with, with the residents and with the riders. Um, I think long term, um, we have to continue to build relationships, there's no question. Um, and one of the things I think is an opportunity to do that will be our, and you probably want to talk further about, but, but our service enhancement plans that we're underway with around the region and our service planning for the Portland Milwaukee opening will embed in it, will be embedded in the service enhancement plan we do for the Clackamas County area. So that's an opportunity to talk more broadly about transit service in Clackamas County. So that's actually the next question. So you know, a dynamic we've seen in the last few years with the economic and budget challenges is that uh, long planned rail projects have opened the Green Line, East Side Streetcar, um, and have you know, utilized service hours at the same time that service hours are being cut on buses. Uh, not a popular place to be. Um, are we going to see something similar with the opening of Portland, Milwaukee, or are all of those service hours incremental? And, and what will happen to the bus system at the same time that, that Milwaukee opens? Well, there, there will be some reallocation of, of service. Um, for example, the 33 doesn't need to run all the way to downtown Portland when the Portland Milwaukee. So some of that savings will go back into the operational light rail line, but there is generally an increment that is new going to light rail, and that was part of the last increment of the payroll tax expansion which as you might, as you remember, Chris, was dedicated to new service. And so one of the new services was the Portland Milwaukee Light Rail Project. And by the way, the last increment of that payroll tax is included in our budget for fiscal 14, starting in January 14. That's the last of the uh, increment up into the 7 tenths of a percent range um, that was authorized uh, in, I think, 2004. Okay. So shifting to another part of the suburbs, uh, we're in planning for the Southwest Corridor. Um, I don't hear a lot of optimism about being able to actually fund construction for a number of years yet. Um, why are we spending resources now to do planning for something that we can't really see the, the horizon when we can fund the construction? Well, I think that's a, that's a great question, but if you think about any of our major light rail projects, they've been 10 to 15 year endeavors. Um, they are not uh, flash in the pan proposals. Uh, I think the most, well, the, the other, other than the airport, which is a public-private partnership, uh, using the federal process, the fastest uh, that we saw was probably the Interstate Max light rail, and that was really a, a, a you know a portion of the South North light rail project. And so even that one, when you think about the work that had gone on prior to our uh, kicking off uh, the Interstate Max project, it was probably 10 years. Uh -huh. 
So um, one of the responsibilities, I think, of Metro, and we're their partner in that regard, is to not think about just tomorrow, but mm -hmm. think about what the future is going to bring. And part of the, I think, the interesting thing about the Southwest Corridor is that it is bringing land use planning up front and, 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 mm -hmm. and close to us first. And so they're starting with what is the land use vision that the communities that in the corridor, whether they be portions of Southwest Portland, or, or Tigard um, or others, what's that vision? And then how do, how do you begin to form a transportation transit system that begins to um, service that, that vision in the right way? It's a little bit different than what we've done before, and I think a little visionary, and I think good, but it also underscores the long-term nature of these plans. Right. And I appreciate that. I've had a chance wearing my planning commissioner hat to work on the Barber Concept Plan work with the stakeholder committee there to uh, get a vision for what Barber Boulevard wants to be when it grows up. Um, but just to, to look at the timeline, I think maybe some of us would expect if we, if we, they're undoubtedly long processes, but if we look at the gap between milestones from a locally preferred alternative to a full funding grant agreement, uh, is it likely that this one will be longer than most or do you think it'll be in the same Oh, I think it will be longer than most. Mm -hmm. And I, I would, would say I think that's the right thing, and, and it gets to the exact point that you were making, which is I think this is the time and this is the space to really build our bus system, to build the best bus system we've got. That's going to be my priority moving ahead. Now, the corridor projects are great support for that, but you know the, the underlying network is our bus system, and we've got to do a good job with that. And that's why I've emphasized you know, bus replacement, for example, in our budget moving ahead, where we're trying to accelerate the, the bus replacement so that we have, uh, uh, we're essentially caught up from the um, lean years of the Great Recession where we didn't replace any buses, and we're actually be caught up by that in, in um, calendar 16. So um, again, we're tr and every penny of our service improvement dollars we're able to scrape together um, for the next budget, uh, fiscal 14, that's going into bus service. And that would be my priority as we move forward. Okay. So while we're on the west side, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the financial performance, or the, we'll say the required subsidy for west is still a pretty staggering number. I know ridership is increasing gradually. Um, <clears throat> is there a point at which we have to take a hard look and say we should just be putting those public benefit dollars into more productive forms of transit in that corridor or elsewhere? Well, there may be, but I don't think that we're at that point. We're seeing every year that West has been open, its ridership continues to grow. Um, and recall that we open during some of the leanest employment years um, and much leaner than were anticipated in terms of the travel forecast that justified the project. So I know, for example, there's currently a call center that's located out at our Millican light rail stop on the west side. That call center is moving down to the former Hollywood video mm -hmm. site in Wilsonville. So frankly, we get an incredible amount of riders uh, to that employment zone. So it's those kinds of shifts and changes that I think will really uh, affect ridership on west. The other thing to recognize about west is that it's really a fixed cost. Uh, and every rider we have will reduce the overall average cost per ride. Um, and we still have room, so we want to continue to uh, lure more riders to Wes. Um, I think it's still fair to say it's, a, it's not a, a completely proven concept, uh, but it is, I think, providing an important service. Uh, I've been spent some time down at or the Oregon legislature and it's interesting to know how many of the staffers and even members are using WES to get to Wilsonville, to get to, to, a, to, Salem. to a bus to Salem. Um, and I think it's beginning to demonstrate its, um, its um, um, utility in that regard. Okay. Uh, in general, you know, as we're continuing to evolve the system and the, the, the frequent service line system seems to be relatively fixed at the moment. We're, not, we're trying to get service back, but we're not adding new lines. What's the state of equity between service in the center of the region versus the suburbs? And are there changes we should look for there, or are things relatively stable? Well, just a, a couple things about that is that one of the things I really, really want to do is get uh, frequent service intervals restored. And so I'm going to be spending a great deal of time 
scraping up the pennies over the next year to see where, where and how we can do that. Uh, a lot of that, of course, depends on the labor negotiations, but uh, even independent of that, I want to begin this effort of getting that service restored because I think it's really important. Um, second of all, your, your question, I think, is an excellent one, and that's why I mentioned earlier the service enhancement plans that we're underway with. And we've essentially are at the cleanup stage of the service enhancement plan for the west side area. Uh, and I'd encourage any of, your, of our listeners to go to our website and look at that plan, but what it begins to do is to create a network of bus service that begins to frankly look a lot like the network of bus service we have on the near and east side of Portland from 82nd in. So in other words, it provides multiple, the ability to serve destinations within Washington County and multiple uh, connections as the grid uh, on the east side also allows. So that's, I think, a great vision that has been really embraced by many of our stakeholders on the west side. But it also begins to tell us how much demand there is for transit everywhere we go. Everywhere we go, every community I go to, people want more transit. Now that's a terrific thing, and I wish I had the dollars in my pocket just to put out more service. But I think it does be indicate that there is a strong potential in the future for some good partnerships. Um, you know, first for me is we've got to demonstrate to our taxpayers and our fair payers that we've got our, our financial house in order. Then I think we, we can look, begin to look for the partnerships to begin to grow service. I can give you another example. Our next um, uh, sector that we're looking at in terms of our service enhancement planning will be the Southwest Corridor, which is sort of parallel the planning effort we talked about earlier. I was down at the 12th and Chamber recently, and I was talking to a number of the business people there. And they're offering on the market jobs that are good entry level jobs, you know, 15 to $20 an hour jobs. And they're having a heck of a time getting people to apply for them because of the lack of transit alternatives to that in Tualatin industrial area. Um, and I hear this message throughout the region. So what I know is that we've got a great product that's really important to the region and that we really need to expand the service. Um, Yes, we need to restore frequent service uh, to those lines that have it now. Yes, we need, we have some gaps in the frequent service network side. You know, I'm a fan of turning the 35 and the 44 and a few others into frequent service before we get, before we get too far along. But we've got these great sectors of employment, uh, new employment opportunities in our suburban areas that we need to connect people to. Um, and we need to do a better job of that. Well, I'll put in a plug then. The planning commission that I serve on has been spending a lot of time uh, looking at East Portland and the needs mm -hmm. out there, and, and having a, uh, a north-south frequent service line in East Portland would go a long way to the needs of that community.